Good afternoon. My name is Alice Christman, and I am the Senior Manager of Marketing and Community Engagement at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and welcome to Oyster Farming on the Bay. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love a good oyster, especially in the summer with a nice chilled beverage. But today, how are oysters going to go from the tide to my table or your table during an era of social distancing? And how is the oyster farm in farming industry faring in general? And why is aquaculture important to the Bay? We're going to answer these questions and more with today's panel. First, we're gonna, we're gonna get to meet our panel. Um, joining us just up the road in Annapolis, Maryland, we have Allison Colden, a fisheries scientist in the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Maryland, Maryland office. Uh, live from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, the mighty, mighty Eastern Shore, we have Scott Budden, who's the co-owner co-owner of the Orchard Point Oyster Company. Scott, if you could give us a wave. Hi. And finally, um, from Virginia Tech, but quarantining happily with his wife in Knoxville, Tennessee, we have Jonathan Van Senten, an economist from Virginia Tech, co-author of a recent economic analysis on aquaculture, or as you may know it, oyster farming. Now, we are taking questions today. Please ask them in the Zoom chat, and we will address them at the end of the program. Now, we're gonna start where we always like to begin at the Chesapeake Bay Chef Foundation, and we're gonna start with the science with Allison. So I'm gonna share the screen so we can have some fun visuals going on here um, to go along with our presentation today. Allison, let's get this going. Oh dear, sorry guys, we are not as ready as I thought we were. All right, Allison, let's take it away. Let's start by talking about um, aquaculture and its contribution to the Bay's health. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, aquaculture, just like agriculture is on land, aquaculture is farming in the water. So aquaculture refers to the process of cultivating aquatic species, either plants or animals, in the water. Um, in Maryland and in the Chesapeake Bay particularly, uh, we are primarily focused on cultivating the eastern oyster, uh, which is the species name is Chrysostria virginica for all of you playing at home with Latin bingo. And um, there are two distinct methods that are used in the Chesapeake Bay for cultivating the eastern oyster. Um, the first is called bottom culture, and that's where oyster shell or oysters themselves are placed directly on the bay bottom in areas that are leased from the sea. And the other alternative is called water column culture, and that's where oysters are placed in cages that are either uh, several inches off the bay bottom or floating near the water surface, um, where they place those oysters for several years to grow before they're harvested and make their way to your table. Awesome. And so we're talking about oyster restoration and we've talked about aquaculture, but let's talk a little bit about aquaculture's contribution to the bay's health in general. As many of you may know, oyster populations in the Chesapeake Bay are at an extremely small fraction of what they used to be historically. And that's due to many years of over harvesting, water pollution, and disease. So one of the important aspects of oyster aquaculture is that it provides a means to get back some of the important functions that our wild oyster population used to provide in the Chesapeake Bay. So for example, oysters um, produce their own habitat, which we call oyster reefs. And they were so large historically that Captain John Smith in his early writings suggested that they were um, actually hazards to navigation to ships coming up the Chesapeake Bay. And when we lost our large oyster populations, we also lost these reefs. But what oyster aquaculture can provide is a means by which we get more oysters back in the bay. And that provides water filtration, which improves water clarity. Uh, when these oysters are harvested, the nutrients that are within their tissues and their shells are taken out of the bay. It can help reduce nutrient loads and those nutrients that would otherwise cause algae blooms and dead zones. And also some of that gear that I mentioned earlier um, can actually provide a novel habitat for some of the same fish, crabs, and other critters that would otherwise be inhabiting an oyster reef. So they really provide an opportunity to bring back some of the ecological function that's largely been lost by our wild oyster populations. 
now we it's so we know that that obviously we know that the alpha culture is important to making sure that we we keep that natural oyster population uh, you know moving along but um speaking of aquaculture in general it, there's been a huge impact i'm sure from the recent coronavirus issues and restrictions yeah exactly um and so not only does aquaculture provide important ecological benefits to maryland and the chesapeake bay uh, but it also provides economic opportunities so there's been an industry and we'll talk about this more but an industry that's grown up around uh, putting oysters back in the bay and to growing the aquaculture industry. And that's been really important because in the United States, uh, we have an annual seafood trade deficit of about $12 billion. And what that means is that every year in the United States, we consume about $12 billion more seafood that's imported from other countries than is produced here domestically. So that represents a real opportunity to increase domestic seafood production and provide local fresh seafood for Marylanders and people throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed through aquaculture. Oh, well, we're gonna get to a chance to meet one of those aquaculture, aquaculturists, one of our oyster farmers now. Scott, I'd like to um, give, the, give the microphone to you. Um, if you could just talk a little bit about your business and um, what you're what you're experiencing right now we also have some some great pictures of, of some of the work that you do so feel free to give us give us the scoop on how things are going sure thank you alice um uh -huh. so my name is scott budden and i'm a co-owner of orchard point oyster company um, i have two other partners hal mcbee and brian Connolly. um and yeah we were getting a lot of momentum going forward with the farm in terms of scaling it um we had to deal with you know 2018's pretty historic rains, or I guess historic rains in terms of the record levels that fell here in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. That was a major impediment to the actual growth of the farm. Literally the mixture of the bay uh, became a little bit too fresh. And overall from where we farm all the way down to the mouth of the bay, it really slowed things down. So, you know, we're like, okay, that's mother nature throwing us a curveball. Let's regroup in 2019, see what goes on. Um, started to get more momentum, put more oysters in the water, and then, you know, something like this kind of comes out of the woodwork in terms of another natural event. So, yeah, I mean, we got an oyster farming uh, primarily to, you know, improve the water quality of the bay and supply the ever-growing demand for domestic, sustainably raised uh, seafood, in this case, oysters. Um, prior to oyster farming, I was not working on the water. I was not a commercial waterman. I was actually in D.C. for the better part of a decade. Uh, working in corporate America, um, similar to an office like this, uh, minus the banner. And uh, yeah, it, it just wasn't super fulfilling for me in terms of my personal goals and business goals. And so um, started the farm back in 2015, uh, um, started the brand, which would point oysters then, and then started selling shortly thereafter in 2016. Um, and then two partners, Brian and Hal, came along in 2018, uh, kind of in the middle of that deluge of rain we were having. And we teamed up and decided that we were you know, stronger together. Um, we could scale a lot faster. So that's what we've been doing the past couple of years. Um, you know, it was that uh, 2018 was a little bit of an issue on the supply side uh, because of slowing down of growth on, around the farm or on the farm. And now it seems like we're somewhat in a demand problem um, given the situation with restaurants. Um, I don't know how much you want to dive into, you know, what's going on with the exact economics, but, you know, basically, you know, we were dependent upon restaurant sales for the majority, if not pretty much all of our uh, sales off the farm. And so over a period of a weekend or so, um, all sales basically went to zero. So we had to figure out how to kind of reinvent ourselves and pivot very quickly. Um, fortunately, we have a good amount of high quality premium oyster supply on the farm right now, stuff we anticipated really moving to restaurants and through distributors um, this spring and summer. So it's kind of like, how do we now adapt as a business? How do we stay nimble? Um, we basically targeted the direct to consumer uh, retail market right off the bat. Um, started doing harvest to order for folks so they could pick up locally on the Eastern shore in Chestertown at the Retriever Raw Bar, as well as at our office in Stevensville and Kent Island. Um, now this week we actually have expanded too to, to doing cold shipping. It took us a little bit of time to work that out because as a FDA certified shipper dealer, you have to make sure everything's getting there safely. You don't want to make anybody sick. You want the product to be its optimum freshness. So I actually just started doing that today. We're sending out our first shipments this afternoon 
via FedEx to people in the watershed and beyond. Um, Because believe it or not, you can actually overnight stuff via FedEx and UPS to a pretty big range. Like we can cover, I think, some parts of New York all the way down through most of Virginia and Richmond. So we're really excited. We've been doing like, you know, a lot of dozen counts or two dozen counts for oysters for people to pick up, that kind of thing. Um, And I think, you know, for the industry overall, there's been a lot of people that have been able to pivot and those who have, um, have done so. Um, Some folks aren't certified dealers or shippers so they're having a little bit more challenges they were selling to a dealer and so they can't sell direct necessarily right now unless they get the the right certification so i mean from what i'm seeing in the industry everybody that can pivot has pivoted some people have decided just you know what i'm going to focus on the farm right now i'm going to get it really in good shape i'm not going to focus on harvesting and sales we have enough to tie this over depending on how long this this thing really lasts but i think speaking broadly for the industry, it was a very big blow to have restaurant sales, you know, go basically to nothing um, in a matter of a few days or a week. Um, so that's kind of the overview of, of where things are with the farm. I'm happy to get in more about you know, the specifics of how we farm. Um, but it's the water column uh, method that Allison is referring to. Um, we, we raise everything in surface floats and also um, bottom cages. You can see there in the nice picture of that aerial drone footage. Um, the surface floats that we employ and that that creates a really nice oyster uh takes a lot of the wave energy uh from the wind and the waves and transfers it to the oysters to create a really nice product so it's just kind of one of those things where we've got millions of oysters i think we put in nine million over the last two growing seasons we're planning on doing a similar load this this growing season and you know it's it's just a little frustrating because we've got this great supply we'd love to you know share it with more chefs and restaurants but in the time for the time being you know we're going to make that product available to the general public and anybody that has a, a mailing address right now in this, this geographic region. Um, so thank you. You're, I mean, you're welcome. Like, and it sounds like what, what you're doing is a pivot. It's a reinvention, which is what a lot of businesses have been, been facing, uh, ever since, ever since the, we've been living under different restrictions, but you know, here are some, here's ways to get in touch with, Scott and order some great oysters from him. We also have a listing on the Chesapeake Bay Foundation page for other oyster farmers who are providing similar types of delivery services to it throughout the watershed. Um, uh, we can provide that link uh, on social media later and, and responding to everyone when we uh, complete the complete the webinar. Um, but, you know, we, we're hearing this story, this current story, but um, we uh, worked with Jonathan Van Senten and some, some other folks from Virginia Tech on, you know, taking an analysis, looking at the aquaculture industry in general. And so I'd like, I'd like us to, to shift gears to hear that, that side of the story. So, um, Jonathan, I'm going to give the mic to you and let me know when to click through on here for you. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Sorry, the uh, the uh, lawn care service <laughs> just came by <laughs> right now with their leaf blower. Great timing. Yeah. Um, so my name is Jonathan Van Senten. I'm an assistant professor, extension specialist at Virginia Tech Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics. My focus is entirely on aquaculture, uh, primarily also seafood and some offshore energy now. Um, So we were really excited when Chesapeake Bay Foundation approached us to do this study, um, looking at the economic impact of oysters in Maryland. Economic impact analysis, as I'm sure some of you are aware, is something economists do quite often. Um, So we thought it was really cool to have this opportunity to work on this project with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So um, if you could, yeah, I guess, get started on. So I, uh, this work was done together with Dr. Carol Engel, uh, Matt Parker at the University of Maryland, and Donald Webster, extension agent with the Maryland Extension, as a collaborative effort between us. So before I talk about the actual economic impact, um, it's important to kind of lay the baseline, so kind of characterize the shellfish industry. As Allison mentioned in her introduction earlier, Uh, There really are two different culture methods that are used, uh, the bottom culture. So here you see a chart uh, over time tracking the growth of that section of the industry from 2010 uh, to 2018. And you can see just in general terms, 
you know, the, the increase there, both in the number of leases and the number of acres uh, that are being uh, put into production. Uh, as of the January 2017, there were a total of 254 leases and over 5,000 acres. Uh, next slide, please. And then these have, are the uh, numbers for the water column, column culture uh, in, the, in, the, in Maryland. So you can see here again, uh, this time a much more uh, steep curve on increase there for the number of leases and the number of acres going into production. Uh, it's a smaller segment of the industry at the moment, but just looking at the lines, you can tell that it's got a, a faster growth rate uh, over time. Uh, so this is really the part of the industry that's taking off right now too, uh, is that water column production. So with a total as of January 2017 of 64 leases and 290 acres in production. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the actual um, harvest. If we look at what's actually harvested, the Maryland Department of uh, Natural Resources keeps track of this information. And so if you look, the average annual growth rate uh, for the five-year period from 2013 to 2018 was 24%. Uh, Scott did mention, and he's right, you can see it here in the data, that 2018 was a little bit of a bad year. Uh, that was primarily because of fresh water input into the bay. And you can see that reflected here in the data with the 2018 harvest numbers being lower than uh, the 2017. So you can see that growth right up until 2017 when, and then the 2018 decline. Uh, that decline was not experienced equally across the two different production forms. As you see here on the slide, um, bottom culture experienced a 26% decline and water column culture a 16% decline. Now I'm not a uh, I'm not I'm not a biologist, so I can't explain why that is, but Sorry. that's what the data show. Um, oh no, please. Next okay, slide. thank you. Okay. <laughs> so what we did um, to be able to get the data that we needed, we had to do a survey directly with producers with the industry in Maryland, and that meant actually getting on the phone or going out and meeting with people in person to complete some surveys to gather the information that we needed. Um, impact assessment is done through input output modeling, uh, but the programs that we use don't have models that represent aquaculture. So one of the things we have to do is we have to create our own model for aquaculture that we can run through that software to come up with our es uh, estimates. So um, all respondent information that we collected is of course treated as confidential. We understand it's private business information. So we only use the aggregate in our models going forward. Um, and we, of course, we don't publish anything that's specific to any one farm. Okay, so in terms of uh, impact, so that's what I think people want to know about. Uh, when you talk about economic impact, that's the part they want you to talk about. So when we look at employment, uh, you'll see here on this table that there are two years modeled, uh, 2018 and 2017. We did that primarily because we did see that decline in 2018. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, and we had seen previously that nice growth up to 2017. So we thought we'd use our model to estimate 2017 numbers as well. So in terms of direct effects, I guess I should explain, maybe this is a good time for me to explain a little bit about what direct, indirect, and induced means for the people listening in. So direct effects are those which are uh, specific to that industry. So direct employment at the farm. Okay. That's an example. Indirect effects are those experienced by related industries that are tied or linked to the farm industry. So for example, someone that buys fuel for their boat is supporting the petroleum industry, okay? And then induced effects are those broader effects that are changes in household expenditures from income. So income that's generated then gets spent on things like healthcare and utilities and groceries and things of that nature. And then the total, of course, is just adding all of those up. So when we look here, we can see that the direct effect in 2017 was estimated at 130 jobs supported by the Maryland oyster industry. And in 2018, 103 jobs. Um, and then of course the total, once we account for the indirect and induced effects was 167 jobs in 2017 and 133 in 2018. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of value, um, here you can see different types of, again, I'm just showing the total effects here to kind of simplify things, not showing the direct, indirect, and induced. Um, but there's a couple different ways to look at this, right? One is the labor income, so the actual income that goes back in labor, and then total value added. So from all those activities that happened, what is the value added to the economy? And then the total output, which again, if you look closely, you can see that that's those things added together, right? So in terms of a total output effect for 2017, we estimated that the impact of the Maryland oyster industry was uh, over $9.7 million. And for 2018, $8.1 million. Uh, again, that 2018 number is a little bit lower because of those effects that were experienced, as Scott mentioned, because of fresh water input into the bay. Uh, I do want to say that our response rate was a primary limitation for the analysis. Obviously, if we had a 100% response rate, then our models could be close to perfect, never quite perfect. Um, but, you know, it's unrealistic to assume a 100% response rate. Um, so that's always something to keep in mind. Uh, another thing I want to point out is that we did want to include processors, wholesalers, and distributors with our model to capture the totality of the industry. But unfortunately, we weren't able to get very good participation at those levels. So they're not reflected here in this data. What you're seeing here is just the farm level. Awesome. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, the oyster industry in Maryland has grown very rapidly over recent years, as you saw from the charts in the beginning. Uh, oyster farming in Maryland does provide valuable employment opportunities for watermen and others in coastal communities. And the Maryland oyster industry does support a wide variety of other economic sectors. Uh, in fact, that number is 450 other economic sectors are linked and supported uh, indirectly by the oyster farming industry. So that's quite a few. That is quite a few. Lots going on. Now we also asked you some questions. We wanted to know if you had any other insights on the seafood industry in general. And I think the next couple of slides are going to help illustrate. Yeah. So these these are these are specific to oysters. So again, going back to that division of bottom culture and water column culture, um, you know, Scott mentioned earlier some of the effects of of uh, this this pandemic right now on the industry the loss of a market avenue, which is restaurants. Uh, the National Oceanographic Administration estimated back in 2018 that about 68% of all seafood in the U.S. is, is consumed or purchased at, at restaurants um, or food service establishments. Um, so you can see here in this chart, really, this is the, the harvest mapped out by month over the course of the year. And so really, you can see that that period from, from March to May for bottom culture harvest especially seems to be that peak. And that's right the time where we're in right now. So then imagine, if you will, looking at this chart, what that means for the industry losing their major market channel right at the peak of their, their harvest season. So, you know, the, the effects are really very serious to the industry. Uh, and I think the chart just does a good job of illustrating that. If you look at the, the next chart, which is uh, water, column, uh, uh, water column culture harvest, it's much more stable, but you do see still kind of that trend where the harvests start to take off more coming into the spring, and then they kind of level off over the summer and then maintain pretty pretty level throughout the rest of the year. So maybe a little less affected in some sense, but but still definitely a ramp up in this time frame um, that we're in right now. And I think you know again, this is just for oysters. This isn't looking at other forms of aquaculture. Uh, or seafood, but I think this does a pretty good job to help visualize why the effects right now of having that market channel shut down are so detrimental to the industry. Mm -hmm. This is peak season, and so it's turned into peak pivoting season for a lot of a lot of uh, proprietors and in that industry, a lot of seafood industry business folks. So interesting, good to note. Good to know. Um, we're going to shift to some Q&A, and I am going to check in with my faithful assistant, Emmy Nicklin, to see what questions we may have generated. We've got 170 faithful audience members from Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Emmy, what, what questions do we have? Great. Well, we have a lot of questions out there, so excited about that. 
Um, I'm going to try to get through as many as I can. Um, the, so Lisa asks, if oysters are sometimes placed right on the bottom, why is it stressed that oysters in cages will die if you do not keep them above the very bottom? I'm going to give that to Allison. Oysters in cages are, uh, sorry, I missed the last part, Emmy. Oh, um, let's see. So she asks, um, why, uh, why is it stressed that oysters in cages be kept above the very bottom? Okay, yes, yeah, so it's two different um, methods of cultivation. And uh, when I say place directly on the bay bottom, um, it's a bit of an oversimplification. So um, usually you wanna make sure that your oysters are not directly sitting in the mud. Um, that does negatively impact the oysters and their growth and survival. But usually um, people who are doing bottom culture will make sure that there's a nice layer of oyster shells or other hard bottom underneath those oysters so that they are not sinking into the mud. And when you place the oysters in cages, they're just slightly above. Um, usually, Scott can weigh in here, but um, eight to 12 inches above the bottom. Uh, not only does that allow the water to move completely around the oysters as they're growing, um, but they are also grown in a different way. So they have to be containerized because those oysters that are being grown in the cages are grown as single oysters, as opposed to oysters that are grown on the bottom, which are a product called sat on shell. Yes, single that's oysters. Showing, that's showing, that's showing up some oysters now in his. Yeah, these are singles. Yeah. So they have to be containerized because they are, they are single oysters as opposed to being oysters growing on other oyster shells. Awesome, thank you. All right. um, Rod Newton asks, does it help to put our shells after we eat them back in the bay? And I love this question. <laughs> Allison, do you wanna take it? I also love this question because yes, <laughs> please, please recycle your oyster shells. Um, so oyster shells are one of the most limiting factors that we have in rebuilding oyster populations and oyster habitat in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I just mentioned the product called spat on shell and the way that that is produced is that hatchery produced oysters that are, that are um, spawned in the hatchery are actually set, meaning they attach themselves to oyster shells and then those are placed back out either in an aquaculture setting or for restoration on reefs that are located in oysters harvest sanctuaries. And so it's very important to recycle your oyster shells. Every single oyster shell that you recycle can be the home to 10 new juvenile oysters. So for every shell that you give back to CBF, um, we, can, we can make 10 more oysters from that. And uh, maybe one of our faithful uh, online assistants will um, post CBF has public drop-off locations throughout Maryland and Virginia, and we'll make sure that we the link out to you guys so you know where you can drop off your oyster shells for recycling. Yeah. yeah. Let me just take a look at the time. I think we have time for one more question, but if you ask a question in the chat, don't worry. We are recording these the chat, so we, we, can, we may be able to get back to you um, after the show, but is there enough, one more pressing question that we need to yeah, let's see. Stephen asks, um, as the restaurant industry begins to recover, there will be a glut of farmed oysters in the same situation as Scott um, that will be coming, uh, oysters coming to market with a large supply that could impact price negatively. Is there any state or federal action? Um, apologies, the scroll. Yeah. It's okay. I never <laughs> um, get you. Yeah, is there any state or federal action being considered to buy market-sized or over-market-sized oysters to use as reef restoration? It would help the bay and estuaries on the East Coast and also help balance the supply and demand situation this summer. I guess I'll take that one. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> um, there, to my knowledge, there is no uh, state or federal plan at this moment to uh, buy oysters directly. I do know that the CARES Act has money in it for $300 million. Um, I have heard from uh, directors and the board at the National Aquaculture Association that there is discussion about making more money available for aquaculture. Um, and so we're hoping to contribute to that effort with uh, some data that we're collecting right now about the impacts to the industry. Um, 
And that, I don't know how that money is going to be distributed yet uh, for aquaculture. I don't think that's been determined as far as I'm aware. Uh, but there is 300 million for aquaculture specifically that should be um, implemented in a way to help the industry. And I hope that we learn more about that soon. In terms of price, uh, there is some concern, uh, as, as I think the question kind of alludes to about a glut that there may be an oversupply at some point when markets do reopen, uh, leading to a crash in prices. It's not been, it, it's happened before, I would say, um, quite a few years ago, and it's happened in other sectors as well. Um, it's something that I think people are aware of. So um, I, it'll be interesting to see how that develops, I guess is where I'm going. Um, we're modeling a couple scenarios right now together with Matt Parker at the University of Maryland. Um, looking at what would happen. We have some enterprise budgets that we've developed based on the data that we have directly from producers. So we're modeling some different scenarios uh, on price changes and price effects in terms of uh, viability for companies right now. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. And that is going to conclude our Q&A for this time. I just have a few little resources to share before we, um, before we say goodbye. Before we say goodbye to everybody. Um, what you can do, you can support the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance. This is a group of stakeholders such as Scott who are interested in having 10 billion additional oysters in the Bay by 2025. You can order direct from oyster farmers. We have links on the Chesapeake Bay Foundation website with including um, details on oyster farms throughout the watershed to order from, just like the Orchard Point Oyster Company. You can also go to orchardpointoystercompany.com, get some delicious oysters delivered to you today, and recycle those oyster shells that helps us keep, keep the dream alive. Um, and please, as always, support Clean Water, cbf.org slash give, and please give us a follow or send us some pictures of you out enjoying the bay on one of our social media channels. And with a final thank you to, special thank you to our great panel who were very flexible during some technical challenges to our audience members who are on Zoom. I'm gonna leave everyone with a moment of zen. And this is straight from Scott's office out on the Eastern shore. Thanks all. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us out on the bag. Bye. Thank you.